My name is Teresa Rusnak, and I am a regional vegetable specialist with the Cornell Cooperative Extension. I'm glad that you're able to join us today for today's workshop, where we will be discussing um, organic pesticides as well as um, crop insurance. This is the uh, seventh workshop in the eight part Spray Safe Spray Well series that will be taking place through the end of March. These workshops are possible thanks to the support from a Northeast Extension Risk Management Education Award. I'd like to also acknowledge the support that the language justice team has provided throughout the series with translation, interpretation, and preparing for the Zoom meetings. This session is being recorded and a link to the recordings in both Spanish and English will be shared when they are available. If you have any questions during the presentation today, please write them in the chat box and we will read them aloud to the presenter during a question and answer period following each presentation. If time allows, we may be able to ask participants to unmute to ask questions during that time. For now though, please make sure to keep your microphone muted during the presentations. We will also be launching a couple of polls after the presentation today. While participation in the polls is not necessary, the information that we gather helps us communicate to our funders the importance of this kind of work. We have two presentations today. The first presentation is understanding how and which organic materials of the Organic um, Review Institute or OMRI listed insecticides work. And that will be followed by a shorter presentation on whole farm revenue crop insurance. So let's begin by introducing our first speaker, Dr. Anna Legrand. Dr. Anna Legrand obtained her doctorate in entomology from the University of Maryland and currently works in the Department of Plant Science and Landscape Architecture at University of Connecticut. Her vegetable integrated pest management research and extension interests are in the areas of biological control and plant insect interactions. Thank you, Dr. Legrand, for joining us today to help us better understand how organic pesticides work. Thank you for that introduction. So I'll start sharing my screen now. All right, good afternoon, everybody. Buenas tardes a todos. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Ana Legrand, and uh, as you were, you were hearing, I'm an entomologist with interest in biological control. And today I'm happy to give you uh, an introduction to some of important materials that are listed by OMRI, the Organic Material Review Institute. So I also at the start, I wanna thank the interpreters that are helping us with this session. All right, just to get going, um, one of the things I wanna set uh, for our understanding is really uh, to uh, describe the role that these uh, organic pesticides play and uh, you know what uh, makes them be listed in the OMRI uh, listing. The um, organic pesticides are natural and synthetic substances, but they have to meet the um, United States Department of Agriculture national organic program requirements. And it is important to realize that um, the substances have to meet a very stringent set of requirements uh, to, to be considered as such. And to comply to the, with the requirements, both the active and inactive ingredients in a pesticide have to, uh, have to be compliant. The um, program under OMRI, the Organic Materials Review Institute, it's, it's a very important program. It's one that helps us review and evaluate a number of materials that up to today have been listing over 8,000 um, OMRI products, OMRI listed products. And OMRI plays a very integral role in doing this. They are a nonprofit organization established back in 1997 to provide these independent reviews. So we, we really take advantage of, of these reviews to give us an assessment of what materials are considered to be following this strict set of rules set by the National Organic Program. 
Now, one of the things I want to highlight before I really get going to discuss uh, a number of, of pesticide products is to emphasize that the National Organic Program rules really call for or, or highlight uh, the need to follow a systems approach where we have uh, or we give a priority to all kinds of preventive practices and we really give a first uh, use to them, practices such as crop rotations, sanitation, the use of mulches, the conservation or use of natural enemy, which are beneficial organisms that can help us with the pest management. So all of these practices are very important. And these preventive practices are really our first kind of set of tools that we should go for according to the NOP rules. And if we don't have a success with that, we, we can uh, make use of the organic pesticides. So it is within this framework that these materials are considered. And so today I wanna give you an overview of a number of materials that are listed by OMRI. And it is relatively easy to um, know which materials are listed as such. One of the first things we will look for is the um, icon that you see here on the screen on the uh, top right. You can see this uh, logo uh, indicating that some relisted. So when products have been evaluated by OMRI, they will receive um, a certificate and they will also um, be identified as such typically by, by this logo. And later at the end of the session, I will be sharing with you a number of resources that will help you uh, find more about, you know, how to, how to decide of where to figure out what, when a product is listed or not. So let us look at what materials are typically um, falling within this category of OMRI listed. We're going to find a great variety of them, but today I'm going to be discussing three sets in general, beginning with microbial insecticides, followed by botanicals, and at the end, uh, kind of a mixture group, a miscellaneous group that includes oils, fermentation products, and soaps. So beginning with the microbial insecticides, this is um, a well-known group, uh, including organisms um, like Bacillus thuringiensis or Berberia bassiana. Both of these um, organisms have been formulated into commercial products that are used as, as biopesticides and uh, they have a, a very long history of use. So we'll begin with this and then I'll follow with the, the other groups as well. And the first one here, Bacillus thuringiensis, it's a, a very well-known uh, biopesticide, uh, has been in commercial use over 70 years. So it's probably one of our most successful examples of, of, um, of a commercial biopesticide listed by OMRI. And this, um, this uh, bacterium has a very long um, you know, uh, record of research. So we know a lot about it and it's really a very common uh, product. Bacillus thuringiensis is also known for short as BT. Uh, so you're gonna hear me say a lot about BT. So think about uh, Bacillus thuringiensis in that case. This bacterium occurs naturally in the soil and on plants. And once it was figured out to have insecticidal activities and really, um, as I told you, became, has become a, a very common product uh, in use. One of the key things that we need to understand with the use of BT is uh, the importance of how it works and how you uh, will make sure that it's, uh, it's gonna have its impact on the pest. The, the primary thing to understand is that the pest has to ingest the material, it has to consume it after you obviously have applied it to, to the surface of plants. And so it is that uh, aspect that is key to, to understand. It's, it will not work just by, um, you know, um, a pest insect coming into contact with it, it has to be ingested. Another very important aspect to, to keep in mind is that BT will have uh, most success if you apply it against the younger stages of an insect, uh, the young instars. So that's where we have seen the most efficacy. So it's really important to try to get um, the use of this material as early as you can once you notice that an application is required. Very important aspect regarding BT is also the, um, the benefit that it's not toxic uh, against other non-target insects, 
particularly really um, minimum, having minimum toxicity again, uh, against natural enemies, those uh, insect predators or parasitoids that we really need to conserve to make our whole enterprise of pest management more, more successful. And lastly, uh, we see that this material is really not um, phytotoxic, meaning that it doesn't have a toxic ag effect against plants. But let me let me go back to, to the aspect of how it works, because it's really this is important uh, regarding uh, BT. So what I'm going to do next is just to share this um, image with you here. And you're showing you um, a very simplified schematic of the, the function of BT, where we see that after a product is applied on the surface of the plant, the insect will um, ingest the material and at the same time ingest uh, um, a mixture of the Bt spores together with a, what we refer to as a Bt toxin. This is a form of a, a crystal that you see here that I'm um, sort of circling in red. And as soon as the insect ingests this, the uh, Bt toxin will become activated by the very special conditions within the insect gut. And it is in this environment that once that toxin is active, it's going to um, bind, it's going to um, kind of connect itself to the um, cell layer of the uh, lining of the insect gut or the alimentary canal, if you will. So this is what it's illustrated. Um, as you can see here in the second picture, those um, active crystal uh, toxins that they will become activated and the toxin itself uh, will bind to the lining. And I'm just circling that a little bit here in red again. Essentially, um, this is a very complicated process. It's, it's not as simple. There are many steps that take take place and but at the end result is that the gut of the insect is perforated um, the binding of the toxic with the lining of the alimentary canal leads to these uh, perforations so that the gut bacteria that is found um, in the gut of the insect will move to the rest of the body and cause these major infections uh, or septicemia as it's known and this is really what kills the insect and Bt proliferates within the dead insect and we will start the cycle again. So it's, um, it's of very much importance that the insect um, consumes the material for it to be effective. And as I mentioned before, you have to really um, best to target the younger instars, the, the younger stages of, of, of the target insect. Now, Bt is also well known for having a number of subspecies. And this is another key aspect of understanding how Bt works, is that we're going to be very mindful of selecting a particular subspecies to target a given a pest. So for example, if we are in need of managing Lepidoptera caterpillars, we have to be observant of selecting the subspecies Korstaki or potentially selecting the subspecies uh, Aizawi. And these are a couple of examples that I'm listing here. Uh, you can see some of the commercial products. Uh, subspecies Korstaki may be available under the name of Dipel and subspecies Aizawi under the name of Shentari. Now, again, this is um, uh, the importance of understanding that for each uh, type of BT, you're going to be having a, a, a very specific set of targets. So these two subspecies will only be good for Lepidoptera caterpillars. And, um, you know, that's where it will be most efficacious. If you were to apply this BT against other target insects, let's say, maybe you were um, trying to control some beetles, that will not work just because of the mechanism of how Bt um, binds inside of the, uh, of the gut of the insect that I showed you earlier. So it's, a, it's a, kind of like a lock and key mechanism. And that's what it, this gives very specific um, associations. Um, we have here an example of the soybean looper. This is um, again, a, a very important caterpillar pest. And you can see what happens after the insect has consumed um, a Bt um, product with the, with the plant material. After 48 hours, you, you see this caterpillar has, has died. And so it's uh, relatively sh short in time in, in terms of the effect. After 48 hours, you can expect to be seeing um, 
these dead caterpillars. And that will be very similar for other, other such caterpillars. Now, there are other uh, types of BT that I do want to mention quickly, just so that you are aware of their um, existence. This is a um, another uh, subspecies, Israelensis. This is one that it's targeting mosquitoes, fly, and fungus gnat larvae. These are um, this type of BT is very specific to this group of insects, and a commercial product um, that contains it will be, for example, natural, uh, primarily for the targeting of mosquitoes, which um, will be like fungus nuts, uh, a very important uh, a group of, um, uh, a very important group of pests in, in the greenhouse. Now, the um, other two species that I want to mention, Galeria, strain SDS-502. This is a relatively newer, um, newer species, relatively speaking, uh, that has been found to have insecticidal activity against a number of scarab beetles. These are very important group of, of pests. And uh, one of the ones that probably you're very familiar with is the Japanese beetle. This is a very important pest. And we see this um, subspecies Galleria uh, having an impact on, on this pest. Now, for a commercial product, um, there is not um, the one that we have available, beetle gone uh, ag, it's not yet OMRI listed, but I did wanted to mention that uh, it is a product that's available that uh, has this type of BT and is marketed against a number of scarab beetles uh, for, for many of the adult stages that um, can be important, especially for the Japanese, Japanese beetle. Now, the... Um, if efficacy of BT, again, it's uh, one that could be variable as you can see here in this chart. I'm showing you this chart just to um, give you an example of the type of resources that are available out there uh, that one can avail uh, to look at the efficacy of a number of OMRI listed products. This particular chart comes from the resource guide um, for uh, insect and disease management. The resource guide for organic insect and disease management is a very important uh, publication. And I'll give you a link to where you can find it uh, at the end of the, of the talk. But for this um, example here, you can see that this, this, uh, these charts are a nice summary of a number of uh, trials that have been done to examine the efficacy of various unrelisted products. And for BT, we see, um, for example, for the um, cabbage looper, for the diamondback moth, which is um, sort of highlighting here, the cabbage looper. There are a number of examples where we see that uh, there are a number of trials that have demonstrated a good efficacy of BT products against these particular insects. So I won't go over through all of the examples here, but I want to um, encourage you to make use of this guide for reference in terms of finding more about the efficacy against particular, uh, particular pest problems. Now, that's, um, that's how all I'm gonna say about BT. There's really a lot more to say, but for time's sake, I really have to move on. Uh, I wanna move to other couple of examples of bacterial-based insecticides. These are newer materials in relationship to BT. BT has a very long history of, of successful use, but we're fortunate that we have more options coming down the line. And one of them is the Chromobacterium subsugi. This is, um, a bacterium that's formulated into a product under the name of Granivo. And we have in this product um, just another option where we can use uh, a bacterium for the control of a number of insect pests. One of the things to highlight for this particular um, product is that the effect or the mode of action will be very different. And we have a variety of um, ways the material will act against insects. So we see that for uh, the Chromobacterium subsugi, we have a repellency effect. We could also see it acting as a stomach poison. And it's also known to be a disruptor of reproduction of the insects. So these are uh, several ways in which the material will have its negative impact uh, on the insect pest. And related to this uh, product, there's another bacterial-based insecticide. This is um, 
the heat kill Burkholderia uh, species. This is um, marketed under the name of Venerate. And this is um, another example of the development of using uh, a bacteria to formulate a, a new pesticidal product. In this case, this uh, product will work uh, through contact and ingestion. So, and we also see that it interferes with the development of the insect. It, it really interferes with the molting. So in both of these cases, with the chromobacterium and with the burholderia examples, uh, we're seeing that the ways they act against the insects are, are more diverse um, in comparison to the previous example of ET. And it is, um, as an example, I just want to show you uh, this next image. This is um, a picture of what we might see what could happen to an insect that has been exposed, uh, in this case, exposed to Burholderia. This is a picture of the arm, the beet armyworm. And this is from a research trial, but it's uh, interesting to note what, uh, what are the effects that are um, happening to the insect after uh, exposure to, exposition to Burholderia. You have um, a caterpillar here that's um, in the process of molting and it really didn't go very well for it. And the poor thing is kind of encased still in the old cuticle and and as you can imagine, that's not going to be very conducive to its survival, not really uh, being able to molt properly and continue with its normal development. So the insect uh, will die. And in comparison, also, you can see in this image to the uh, right, um, the smaller and really um, not happy looking insect that results after exposure to the burholderia. So in general, um, this is just an example of how some of these materials will impact the, the development or, or the molting process of insects. And while um, they may take a little longer time to have a negative impact on the insects, we do see that overall um, the impact on the population can be um, successful. So while it takes a little longer than perhaps um, other insecticides, we do have um, examples where the, the insect will eventually die and cease its normal development. Now with the um, examples of bacterial insecticides, I just want to again highlight the um, that for BT is very important to keep in mind that specificity that I mentioned, knowing about the different target groups is important and knowing about uh, emphasizing the use against the earlier, uh, earlier stages of the insect. And it's good to know that we have other options available that are uh, being more and more researched like the Burholderia example and also the um, Chromobacterium example that I just shared with you. I want to move on to um, the next section uh, to discuss uh, botanical materials, um, botanical pesticides, because these are very important as part of what we see for OMRI listed products. And the first one I really want to discuss is neem, just uh, like BT, um, a very well-known uh, botanical material with uh, really even a longer history of use. The neem material is extracted from the seeds of the neem tree, Asadidacta indica. And this is uh, an amazing plant that uh, has had uh, millennia in terms of, of its use uh, back in the Asian continent in India, uh, really, where this uh, tree is um, of great importance, really not just because of the source of a biopesticide, but really Culturally, it has a great importance in India. Um, this tree has a um, long history of, of use as a medicinal plant. And also, um, obviously nowadays, it's a source of, um, of insecticidal materials. But I, again, I wanted to highlight something about the, the, the importance of, of this tree back in its um, um, you know, uh, place of origin, really. Asadiracta indica is the scientific name of, of this uh, tree. And literally, the scientific name means the free tree of India. That's what the, the words mean. And so that goes to sh really show you the, the strong linkage of this tree, culturally speaking, with, with um, uh, its uses back in India. Uh, Neem, it's, it's uh, very important for us. And as I was telling you, 
uh, has many uses. And since we're talking about the origin of words, I, I, I need to tell you also that niem in itself means in Sanskrit, the bestower of health. So this really will uh, help us remember how many benefits we can get from this particular plant. Um, the neem tree is a source of the compound asadiractin. Asadiractin is what we refer to as the active ingredient, uh, the compound that will have the insecticidal activity. And we're going to find many products that are based uh, or that have asadiractin. And in association with the neem tree, we also find neem oil products, which is another uh, category as well. One of the advantages of neem is that uh, this material has very low toxicity to humans and also to beneficial insects. It's, um, this is one of the reasons why it's such a well appreciated um, uh, pesticidal material. Uh, we have, um, as an example here, the oral LD50, which is a number that reflects the acute toxicity of a pesticide, meaning what can happen to you after one single exposure of the of the of the pesticide we have that this oral ld50 is 5000 uh, milligrams per kilogram which is relatively speaking a very high number and so for ld50s we want the higher the number the better and neem has um, a very good number in this case so this is one key important um, benefit or characteristic of materials that are based uh, on, on this, uh, are, are, that are sourced out of this plant that contain acidiractin compounds. The um, activity of neem um, takes different routes. Um, we can find that its mode of action, how it works against the insects, uh, could take the form of uh, disruption of the development, disrupting metamorphosis and also the molting process. Kind of in a similar way to what I showed you before with the um, picture of the caterpillar uh, that couldn't really molt very well. So this is uh, one mode of action. And another mode of action that we see associated with neem is acting as an antifeedant, meaning that the insect will choose not to feed on the plant. So that's um, a benefit. In the case of the um, disruption of development that probably could take a little longer time to take effect, but still we find many successful cases where uh, NIM has provided control and typically it's recommended for the management of insects like aphids, uh, caterpillars, um, leaf miners, and true bugs as well. One of the aspects to keep in mind though is that it will require multiple applications because it can be quickly um, be broken down by sunlight and also rain uh, can wash it, uh, the material off. So that's one aspect to consider in when using this, these neem products. And also um, when you want to use it as an antifeedant, it also definitely will require multiple ap applications in, in that case. Here's an example of, of the neem tree. This is again, this um, very important uh, plant uh, that gives us the acidiractin compound. And I wanted to show you this image, um, just, uh, you know, you can get to see the plant, but also reflect on, on another aspect, which is uh, the um, information we typically will find in association with this product and many other products too, uh, the, the pesticide level that I'm showing you here. And I'll be telling you a little bit more about pesticide labels later, but again, I wanted to just highlight the fact that um, the products will have this type of label. And in there you will find the name of the active ingredient, which for the NIM products, you can see here, um, perhaps it's a little tiny, it's listing as acidiractin as the key active ingredient, together with a number of other ingredients that as far as uh, being unrelisted, both active ingredients and inactive ingredients have to follow uh, the guidelines. And here you can also find the, the logo that I was mentioning to you, um, identifying this particular product as unrelisted. So that's um, all I wanted to mention for, for naming at this point. We can uh, go also to the um, resource guide that I mentioned earlier and 
uh, look for more information in terms of efficacy. And here is a, a similar chart summarizing a number of trials uh, that have looked at the efficacy against a number of insect pests. And we have uh, here a number of examples that I will just uh, refer you to look on your own, but many insects that have been evaluated. And there's a lot of information out there also through extension materials indicating um, what insects are the best in terms of um, trying to manage them with, with the neem material. So I won't spend too much time on, on this particular chart. This will be available in the um, resource guide that I mentioned earlier. Along with neem, I'm, I'm going to move on to a second botanical pesticide or insecticide, really. These are um, a second example that are well known uh, use, the pyrethrins. This is an extract from the pyrethrum daisy flower. And these pyrethrins are um, being formulated in terms of being used as insecticides since the 1950s. These are uh, neurotoxins. And so their mode of action in this case, uh, these materials are acting against the nervous system of the insects. And so we have to keep that in mind. Uh, they are going to have um, a degree of more toxicity against other insects uh, because of how they operate. As you can see, the oral LD50 is said to be uh, around 1600. So it's much less compared to the neem material. If we uh, remember that. And the, the pyrethrins are um, very effective. They can produce a fast knockdown of the insect pest in terms of um, a faster killing effect. But we also have to keep in mind that um, uh, while they're very effective, they can also be toxic to other non-target organisms. So we have to take care of how we employ these materials. They are known to be highly toxic against fish and also to bees. And for fish too, they have been said to impact uh, fish reproduction as well. So we do have to take care in following the instructions of how to use these materials. And I'm gonna get to that at the end too, in terms of uh, referencing uh, the importance of following the label to make sure that when you apply these materials, you're doing it so that um, there is no risk to other non-target organisms like fish or, or bees. Now the pyrethrins are, um, uh, broaden their spectrum again, they, meaning that they can target all kinds of insects. Uh, so that's why they're very commonly recommended. And uh, there are materials that um, will break down faster after, especially after exposure to sunlight. So this is something that um, um, it's to some extent a benefit that they do not linger in the environment for very long. But on the other hand, um, you cannot expect a long-term effect. Uh, so repeated applications might be needed, um, you know, in terms of using this particular product. Uh, commercial examples include a well-known uh, product on the name of Pyganic that uh, is available in couple formulations. Now, pyrethrins. Um, as I told you, are broad spectrum and have a quick knockdown. So I hope you don't encounter yourself in this situation. Uh, but I'm just uh, making fun. Uh, obviously, um, this is uh, not something that we expect, but just uh, keep that in mind that uh, compared to other products, the pyrethrins will take uh, will have a faster activity. Here is. Um, Another chart from the same resource guide I presented to you earlier. Again, we have um, a number of evaluations that have been done uh, to find out what is the impact on, on various pest problems. And we have um, for caterpillars as an example, uh, we don't have many examples here of um, a good efficacy, but for others like the Colorado potato beetle, like uh, for a number of leaf hoppers, uh, like the potato leaf hopper, or also for the spittle bugs, we do have some records of um, trials indicating that there's efficacy against them. So again, I will refer you to look at this publication as a, as a very good source, not only for this type of information, but I wanna highlight that uh, this publication, the resource guide for organic insect and disease management also contains a number of fact sheets on uh, the OMRI listed products that I have been describing, plus many others that are typically used 
uh, for organic uh, control of insects. And so it's a, it's a great resource in terms uh, that if you want to know more about specific materials, specific active ingredients, um, this guide will have a nice collection of fact sheets uh, for, for that. All right, so uh, as we, it was indicated at the beginning, I, we will be taking questions at the end. So I'm sure you may be having questions about everything that I've been saying regarding BT, uh, regarding the botanicals uh, and so on. And again, I'd be happy to take questions at the end of the session. So please um, hold on to, to that and we will get to that soon. But I wanna continue with the um, another product that's um, also well known as an unreleased product. This is uh, the product Espinosa. This comes from the bacterial fermentation uh, using the bacterium uh, Saccharopoliospora espinose. And I know it's quite a, quite a long name, but it's uh, an interesting bacterium. Um, back in 1982, um, somebody was collecting some so soils samples to find new organisms that had biological activity. And when they were collecting soil samples, uh, somebody did that in, at, the, at the Virgin Islands, and they discovered that uh, in the soil sample, they found this particular bacterium. And after doing uh, some fermentation work with it, um, they found that uh, the, the fermentation products had insecticidal activity. And um, from that point on, you know, a lot of research was done. So nowadays we have this product that uh, we know as Spinoza, which includes a mixture of, you know, other compounds like spinosins. And these materials have um, a very fast acting uh, activity against the insects and they're very broad in spectrum, meaning that it's a wide range of insects that um, can be susceptible to it. This um, Spinoza will work against the insect pest by direct contact and also uh, through ingestion. So uh, in this case, um, the material, as long as it contacts the insect, if you get good coverage, then uh, that will have a negative impact. But also if the insect consumes it, then um, they can also um, be uh, susceptible to it. Now, it's mainly toxic against uh, caterpillars, uh, beetles, thrips, and, and flies. And one of the things that it's important to appreciate is that while it can manage different types of insects, uh, we have to be conscious that um, it can also harm some of the beneficials as well if the beneficial insects like parasitoids or honeybees come into direct contact with the, with the material when it's wet. So uh, if they come into contact with the spray droplets or if they walk on the wet material, that can be uh, harmful to them. So we have to take care of that. And again, as I'm going to highlight later on, it's important to follow the instructions of how the material is to be used so that we minimize any impact on, on the non-target organisms. Now, some of the, uh, the commercial product that some relisted, uh, there are some examples here. Uh, the name of Entrust is, is one product. Uh, you also have Naturalite, uh, Fruit Fly Bait, and Seduce Insect Bait. So there are a number of products that, that contain uh, Espinosa. And again, just keep in mind that when you use it, you want to minimize that the spray droplets will come into contact with um, honeybees and parasitoids as much as you can avoid it. And again, following the label instructions will be uh, key to that. In terms of some of the efficacy studies, we have, um, the, again, the resource guide uh, as a good example for some summaries. We can see here the um, some trials that have been done looking at the efficacy of Spinoza. And we see uh, for caterpillars, a couple of studies uh, showing that there is a good efficacy along for, for some others, other pests as well. And the, um, uh, the label of the material will also give you more information about other pests that uh, could be susceptible to this uh, particular product. Now, because of time, I'm gonna move on to the last group that I have uh, for discussion today, and this is a, uh, the soaps and oils. These are um, another group that's very commonly listed by OMRI because we have here many materials that really are uh, very low in toxicity and um, have a long history of use against a, a number of, of insect pests. 
The first example here are the insecticidal soaps. These are potassium salts of fatty acids. The uh, products here will have um, an action by contact. So they, they have to kind of land on the insect. They have to contact it for them to have a detrimental effect. And particularly, really, we use these materials for soft body insects like aphids, um, or leafhopper names, for example. So soft body insects will be the most susceptible, um, you know, under the use of insecticidal soaps. A commercial product, uh, as an example, is Empil. This is a well-known product. And, and there are many others too that include insecticidal soaps, uh, either um, alone or in combination with other um, organic pesticides. And, the second category here, oils. This is another important uh, group as well. Oils work a little different, as you can imagine, from, from the soaps. In this case, uh, oils particularly have their negative impact uh, on uh, the insects by kind of suffocating them, uh, what we refer to as a smothering action. And in the case uh, of oils, we have uh, mineral oils, so we have plant oils that can have this effect. And one of the key aspects is that we need to make sure that there's good coverage on, um, on the target insects so that um, you know, this contact action can take place. One benefit of oils is that they're very low in toxicity in, the terms, in terms that um, other beneficials will not be impacted if obviously if they're not uh, coming into direct contact with the oil application. One of the key aspects I wanna mention though for oils is that nowadays we have all kinds of a variety of um, insecticidal oils. The ones I'm referring here that have a low toxicity are these mineral oils and, and the plant oils, uh, for example, one that's uh, made with soybean oil. But nowadays we have other oils. So I wanna make sure I point out that uh, you are also going to find uh, examples such as neem oil. This is um, another type of oil that again is extracted from the neem seed. I mentioned this a little earlier. Primarily, this particular oil is for mite control. And uh, you know, it's also said to have some activity against plant pathogens. So this, uh, this is another um, characteristic for this particular uh, product. We also have essential oils, which are um, another category that it's uh, important to highlight. And I separate this from my previous example of oils because in this case, um, we have oils that are, are now being more and more researched in terms of how they act against insects and we understand better their, their activity. And some of them have been found to have neurotoxic action. So that's um, a different type of, of mechanism of how they act against insects. So essential oils, uh, including oils from rosemary, peppermint, clove, and thyme, many products will include this type of oils. So it's important, um, again, to be aware that uh, these oils operate, they cooperate with a little different mode of action, not only um, they will suffocate the insect, of course, but they can also have uh, neurotoxic action on against the insect. So um, that's one thing that separates them from other the other simpler oils that I mentioned before. All right, so that's um, as far as I want to list a variety of, of um, give you a different set of examples for OMRI listed products. Uh, I will encourage you that if you're curious about knowing um, you know, how to figure out which product is listed or not, go to the OMRI website, which I will present later. They have a very nice uh, function to, to search for products or for active ingredients, and you can quickly assess whether OMRI lists them or not. And that's, um, you know, a very nice tool to have. I wanna take uh, a bit of the time that remains just to just highlight uh, some aspects regarding the, the use and the handling of all of these examples that I have, 
I have given you. Um, I know we list them uh, as uh, materials that are based either uh, from botanical extracts or from the use of, of bacteria. Uh, in many of these, uh, all of these cases, many of these products have very low toxicity. So this is one of the advantages of the use. But nonetheless, it's very important to keep in mind that one has to be careful in terms of always using them in a safe manner and not to take them for granted that just because they're a natural product, uh, you don't have to be careful uh, about how you handle them or how you store them. So um, I want to highlight that um, there's a lot of information out there that you could uh, look in terms of uh, proper handling and storage of all of these materials. And a great resource uh, to, to, to use is the National Pesticide Information Center. This is a, a center that presents information both in English and Spanish. So it's a great resource because they have a collection of fact sheets uh, for uh, many of the active ingredients, many of the you know, pesticidal compounds that I have discussed, uh, they have fact sheets that describe in more detail um, what the material uh, does. And also they have many fact sheets about the proper handling and storage of, of the different materials I have mentioned today. And the great aspect of this resource is that not only they have fact sheets uh, that you can find online, but you can also call them or send an email in case you have a question regarding any pesticide product they're a great resource. And so here I list the numbers or you can find them online under the name of MPIC, uh, a great resource to, to look for. But uh, with this in mind, I will now just highlight a couple of aspects in terms of the type of information they, they provide and that I also want to remind you um, in terms of uh, the handling and storage of many of the unreleased pesticides. We treat them just like any other pesticide in terms of storage. You want to be uh, making sure that when you keep uh, the, con the materials, you keep them in their original containers, uh, making sure that the containers have the label, which is a very important piece of information uh, for these materials. Um, the label will tell you how to, proper how to properly store them. And again, we'll tell you a lot about how to properly and legally use them. So it's, it's important to store them with the original labeling. Um, another important guideline is that uh, when you store them, you pick a, a designated location that is well ventilated, that it's only used for this purpose and it's well identified as such as an area to, that's uh, for pesticide storage. And it's an area that is not only well ventilated, but uh, that really does not um, encounter a lot of temperature extremes because that this can also impact the efficacy of, of the materials. So these are just um, some general guidelines. And again, the MPIC uh, Resource Center has a lot more information in terms of um, more storage tips and other guidelines uh, to follow. But don't forget the label, it's really the key. So always make sure that uh, you follow um, the label, which again, is just the um, information that you're gonna find attached to the container. And I'm showing you here just a couple of images. Uh, again, this is coming from the MPIC Resource Center. And you can see that they're presenting information in English and Spanish. And um, one of their key uh, aspects to highlight in terms of the information is the reminder for all of us to always uh, heed the label instructions. It's telling you a lot about what I mentioned earlier, uh, what is the active ingredient. It's telling you about how to properly store and dispose of the material and uh, important uh, how to use it uh, in a legal way. So always follow the, the directions for the use. Another very important aspect that we find here for the label is that they are going to have what we call the signal words. And this is uh, something I will be um, showing you in a minute more about this uh, very important signal words that will alert you about the level of toxicity of a given material. So if you are looking at a label, you should be seeing because by law, the labels have to have an indication of of these um, levels or categories of toxicity and the signal words will alert you to this. So as an example here, we have um, the categories uh, beginning with number one, the first one highly toxic. And um, 
followed by moderately toxic, the third one being slightly toxic, and the last one, low toxicity. These categories are um, set by the EPA, and they are considering um, different types of harmful effects if you were to be exposed to the material. This is really reflecting what we call acute toxicity, meaning what happens to you after a single exposure of, uh, of the, uh, with the pesticide. So it's very important to follow this um, uh, to heed these signal words. As you can see for the first category of highly toxic, the signal word will be danger or poison and uh, followed by uh, the second category, uh, moderately toxic being warning, uh, th that's the signal word. And lastly, for those that are um, slightly or, or low in toxicity, the signal word will be caution. And this is exactly what we saw in the label of the neem pesticide I presented to you earlier. If we go back to that, uh, we have here, um, you know, again, the active ingredient that uh, a acid acting compound. And you can see below, uh, right there, the signal word of caution, which indicating the, the low toxicity nature for, for this particular pesticide. But um, obviously, you know, this may not be the same for all of the unrelisted pesticides, so just always look for, for this signal word um, to give you guidance of the toxicity level. All right, um, other th th things to keep in mind, MPIC also gives you information about um, personal protective equipment, which is very important. And I won't go over through this, but just highlighting that, again, follow the label instructions for the particular requirements of personal protective equipment or PPE. Again, very important to, to heed what they're telling you you need to wear in terms of uh, protection for the skin or the eyes um, and also for inhalation. So usually not shown here, but masks will also be very important uh, part of your PPE. And to end, I want to just uh, refer you here to the um, OMRI listing. This is the um, uh, website where you can find more information about all of these materials and, and much else. This website gives you a nice tool for searching uh, different products so you can quickly assess whether they're OMRI listed. So we'll have that. And other sources of information, uh, there are many, but here are um, a few of them that you can uh, look for. One of them that's really nice is the ATRA website that lists, has a database of different biorational um, products that uh, include many of the ones I have discussed today. And also the New York IPM organic production guides. These are very comprehensive guides that include a lot of information about um, organic uh, management guidelines uh, that also will refer you to what products are recommended for a number of insect pests. And lastly here, uh, this is the, um, the website that I mentioned for you. This is the resource guide that I've been show, sharing with you some of the charts, uh, freely available as a PDF. So um, really a great resource for you to, to have. With that, um, I know time is going by very quickly. I would love to take questions. And I wanna uh, thank the interpreters. Muchas gracias. Uh, gracias a todos por escuchar esta charla. Espero thank que... you. Thanks to everybody uh, for listening to this talk. I hope it's been useful. Uh, this is useful for you and my email is available in case you have any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Legrand. I think we had a couple of questions in the chat box. Um, also, I just want to mention quickly that uh, we did put the link for that resource that you see in front of you, the resource guide for organic insect and disease management. So um, you can find that in your chat box as well. Um, Ethan, did you want to uh, cover some of the questions? Bueno, está bien, este, Anthony. Yes, sure. Anthony had two questions. And I actually think that Anna already answered one of them. It was about essential oils and if they can be used as pesticides. But the other question that Anthony had was, if you can formulate these products 
that contain BT, if you can formulate them so that they can target, kill specific insects, or if they're, they can be used on all. Can you talk a little bit more about how these different products that contain BT work? Um, typically, you will find just, um, well, you have a single subspecies, like a single type, like Kurstaki or Isawe, um, label for the caterpillar pests. And then you may have things like the subspecies Israelensis, uh, mostly for mosquitoes or, or fly pests. So um, unless you have, you, you potentially, I suppose, um, you know, you could spray the different products, but you will have to have the, the different types of pests all, all combined or in a single location for, for that to, to be of use. Um, the, um, one of the things, it's just the, the target pests, are the, the group of them is very specific. So that's one of the limitations in terms of um, perhaps not being able to mix so much different, different formulations. And uh, there's uh, another aspect too for um, BT, um, the Kurstaki or the Aisawi, each of them, while they are good for caterpillar pests in general, um, Aisawi, for example, is, is better for certain caterpillar species like the diamondback moth compared to um, others, um, other caterpillars. So there's, um, you know, the, the, the grouping of the target pests is, is, can be very narrow. So that that's, um, could be a limitation in terms of that particular question. The other um, BT for the beetles, um, there is a BT so species tenebrionis, but I understand that has uh, there has been there have been issues with the availability of that particular product. But the other one, the BT so species galeria, um, that it's available and that's um, that's one that is more specific against um, scarab beetles. It has most uses in, in, in has been receiving more use in turf grass systems, but um, the, uh, at least for the adult beetles, for the Japanese beetles, it has, um, it has been uh, getting more attention. And again, you can see that each type of BT has um, a narrow set of targets. So uh, just, you will have to have sort of the, the right combination against, uh, you know, for, for that type of mixture to, um, to be of use, I suppose. I hope that answers that, but I don't know if there are other questions. Um, I think this is everything that comes out in the chat at this point. I don't think there's any other questions. Thank you. That's good because it's the time is right. <laughs> A little overdue. <laughs> Well, thank you very much. And again, thank you for, for the interpreters uh, and uh, thank you for the invitation. Thank you. Okay, we're going to move on to the next presentation, um, which will be by Elizabeth Higgins. She is the Agriculture Business Management and Production Economics Extension Specialist with the Eastern New York Commercial Horticulture Team. She's serving commercial fruit and vegetable producers in 17 counties in Eastern New York, and as an instructor in the Agricultural Supervisory Leadership Certificate Program. Her focus areas are risk management, farm business management, and ag regulations and programs with an emphasis on land use and labor. And uh, Liz, you can go ahead and share your screen and give us all that great information about crop insurance. Okay, and that's right, right? You can see it okay? Yes. Okay, great. So this is the part where everybody takes a nap, usually. Um, good morning, buenos dias. I'm really glad to be with you all here today. Uh, lo siento, no hablo bien español. So I would first like to I'm thank sorry, the, I don't speak oh. good Spanish. Yep. So I would first like to thank the folks who were able to translate my slides so quickly and also today's translators. Um, I don't have a lot of time today, and crop insurance is very complicated, and it can be very specific to your farm. So I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about the policies, but rather my goal today is to help you broadly understand what there is and what you should consider when thinking about crop insurance. 
Okay, good. So crop insurance and the purpose of crop insurance is really to help you manage your risk on your farm. It's not an investment, it's protection. So that when money is tight on a farm, it can be really hard to justify another expense um, that you're not sure whether or not it'll be useful. And in the case of crop insurance, the federal government subsidizes the cost of the insurance. And the program has been developed so that as a group, farmers pay in premiums what they get out in indemnities. And that's in, in crop insurance payments when there is a disaster. So from the federal level, it is intended as a program that helps farmers pay in to cover for their future losses. Um, so if there is a covered disaster, the only benefit besides loans that most farmers will get um, will be crop insurance. And generally disaster support to farms is in the form of low interest loans. COVID-19 was very different, um, but if it hails on your farm and the hail destroys everything, crop insurance is probably gonna be the only financial help from the government that you'll get except for a loan. Most crop insurance policies are sold by private insurance agents who are authorized to sell crop insurance for the federal government. Um, one program um, called NAP, which is Non-Insured Crop Disaster Assistance Program Insurance is available through USDA Farm Service Agency, USDA's um, US Department of Agriculture. And this is for crops that are not covered by a single crop policy. Single crop policies for specialty crops um, are called APH or actual production history crop insurance. And those are only available for crops in areas where there's enough people growing the crop and enough data about yields and risk that USDA can develop a sound policy for it. So most of you will be more familiar with NAP, the non-insured um, crop program than the single crop policies sold by insurance agents. NAP still though does rely on you having good data about your farm's yields for your crops. And um, so there are two types of um, insurance programs. I briefly covered the ones that cover yield loss, the NAP program and the APH. Um, but there's also another program that covers revenue loss. Um, and that's, it, it, so it ensures um, the amount of revenue you have. And um, when your yields are lower than the insured level um, due to weather or disease or pests or a disaster like a fire, then you can receive a payment. Um, so if we look at this example here, um, if you look at the gray, that would be um, either for revenue or for yield, depending on what you're insuring. insuring. Um, the gray bar at the top would be 100%. So that would be what you would expect to get you know, if there was no disaster under normal circumstances. Um, and so that, and, and in some cases that will be based on your historic yields or your historic revenue. And in some cases that could be based on county averages depending on what kind of data is available. Um, and so the red bar here represents um, either somebody choosing to insure 50% of their yield or 50% of their revenue. And the upper red bar is somebody who chooses to insure 70% of their yield or 70% of their revenue. And like life insurance or like other types of insurance, you can choose your level of coverage. Um, so you can get, you know, you can insure more if you're more risk averse and you can insure less if you're, you know, willing to take on more risk. Um, the lowest you can generally insure is 50%. Um, so in both of these cases, you know, in the first couple of bars, we assume that there's a disaster and that person loses 60% of their, either their expected yield or their expected revenue. If they've insured 50% um, at the 50% level where that green bar is, they would receive, a, you know, they would receive up to, they would receive a payment that would reimburse them for up to 50, up to that 50% point. So you're not, when you get crop insurance and you insure for a 50% level, you don't, if you have a disaster, you don't get 100% back. You know, you're not made up whole, but you're brought up to the level at which you've insured yourself. So the, in this case, they would see, you know, get 10%. The person who insured at a higher rate 
if there's this disaster at 40%, then would see 30%, they would get that 30% of their yield or revenue that they've insured back. Um, so if you have a, if you insure for a higher um, loss, you know, a higher level, you know, you'll receive a, a, a larger indemnity payment in most cases. Um, but you're not, just because you have insurance um, and you have a disaster does not necessarily mean that you will receive a payment um, because it has to be, the disaster actually has to be, um, make you worse off than the, the level you've insured for. So this person who's insured at the 50% level, which is really considered to be like the um, catastrophic level, and they had a, you know, a disaster, whether it's a flood or hail or whatever, um, so that they lost 60, you know, they lost 40% of their yield or 40% of their revenue, they would not receive an insurance payment because they insured below that level. Um, but the person who insured at 70% would receive an insurance payment. They would receive, you know, once again, like that 10% because they insured at above that level. So the amount of, um, the amount of payment you get will depend on the, the level of the disaster and also the level of coverage that you've selected. So I'm going to talk a little bit specifically about whole farm revenue insurance because this is a program um, people tend to be less familiar with. Um, the revenue-based crop insurance um, is based on the farm revenue that you reported on your Schedule F on your tax return, although there are some other ways of calculating it. And unlike the single crop programs, under this type of insurance, you cover all of your crops and livestock if you have livestock on one policy. So if you grow a lot of crops, um, it may be that some of the minor crops would be grouped together and counted as a single crop. So if you only grow small amounts of some crops, they might group those together just for, um, because each of those individual little crops wouldn't be likely to make much of a difference um, on your overall revenues. Um, but, but overall, they look at your whole farm, like all of your production systems as a group. And um, the more crops you have, um, the more diversified you are, the lower rates that you pay. Um, and so this is because the USDA sees diversification as a risk management strategy. The most significant advantage for farmers um, that do direct market sales or, or high, sell to high value markets is that sometimes the payment rates for the yield-based crop insurance program um, is based on wholesale prices for crops. And so that insurance payment um, would be lower than you would expect if you sold the crop. But for the revenue-based insurance, you're insuring your historic revenue so that if you're in high value markets, this would be reflected in the payment. Um, so that is one thing I, I know for diversified farms that, make, that can make a big deal and make this program more appealing. Um, there are some things about this program that can make it a little more challenging. You do need to have um, at least three years of revenue data as a beginning farmer or five years of data otherwise to participate in the program at all. Um, so this is not good for your first year of farming. Um, you'll probably need if you have some high value crops or some crops you need to ensure to look at the NAP program, the single crop program um, for that. Um, you would not be able to use this program. But after you have three years of production history with documented revenue, at that point, you can enter this program. I'm sorry, my, I think my mouse is dying. Um, so what's special about crop insurance? Um, you know, there are some differences from crop insurance to other type of insurance. Um, so first of all, although it's not free, the federal government does subsidize the cost of the premiums, making some policies much more affordable than they would be if you were paying based on actuarial risk. Um, the program is required by law to be designed so that farmers who participate get back an indemnity payments, um, what they put into insurance payments um, as a group. So, but that doesn't mean that you as an individual ne will necessarily see that 
payback. Um, that's going to depend on your farm's situation. Also, one important point um, about crop insurance is that the premiums are based on your farm's situation, and they're calculated by formulas that are set by the government. So although many crop insurance policies are sold by private um, insurance companies, no matter who you buy it from, the premium should be the same. So therefore, when you're choosing a crop insurance agent, you're choosing them based on their knowledge and service. You're not choosing them based on the rate that you will pay for the insurance because everybody, anybody you talk to should use the same formulas and charge you the same rate um, depending on your situation. Um, so they don't compete with each other on price. Um, I do think if you're choosing a crop insurance agent, um, you should try to find one that's familiar with what you grow, for example, because they will be more helpful to you in that they'll anticipate when you'll need help and guide you through the insurance process. Whereas if they don't understand your crops at all, they may not anticipate when there's likely to be a problem um, and be as, as readily available or as, as helpful to you in, in sort of navigating that program. Um, so the big question is, you know, should you even look at these programs? Should you use crop insurance? And like all insurance products, the decision about whether or not to get coverage and how much you need is really personal. In some cases, you may find that a lender requires it. Just like if you have a mortgage on your house, you're required to get homeowner's insurance. If you have a farm loan, um, you may be required to get crop insurance to sort of help protect the lender um, you know, in the case that you have a disaster so that you can make payments. Um, you do want to think about what risks you have on your farm, and these risks could be your farm situation, its location. This farm in the picture, you know, clearly is in an area that could flood. Um, it could be the crops you grow. Some crops are, you know, they're, they, you put a lot of inputs into them, and they're very expensive. And so if you lose that crop, you've laid out a lot of money. Um, and so that's a real risk. Or it could be your family situation. It could be your level of debt. So if you lost your crop, you would also, you know, have debt problems. Um, you, you know, you may have or not have other sources of income, and you may be more or less reliant on the farm to meet your family living. So somebody with high debt or dependents who grow a single crop that it's risk from weather, or is it higher risk? Is at higher risk than somebody with no debt? who has outside income and diversified crops that are spread out over a season or under cover. So, you know, so it really depends on, on you. Um, you also will want to know what types of losses the policy will cover and what it won't cover. Crop insurance won't cover losses due to management error or neglect, or if you use practices or grow crops that are considered to be unusually risky and then they fail. Um, you would also be unlikely to get crop insurance coverage you know, for bananas in New York, for example, um, at a reasonable rate. But even for crops that are grown in New York, um, you know, some varieties might not be covered. So for grape growers, for example, some grape varieties are not covered in New York because they're too vulnerable to cold temperatures. Um, some pests and diseases or weather events are also not covered by some crop insurance policies, or they will re require an additional payment for coverage because of, you know, because the risk is considered to be too high. So, but if the insurance product manage, matches up to your risks, it could be worth considering. Um, and the cost of insurance really might be worth the peace of mind. I know there's a lot that I didn't cover um, and I'll try to answer questions now if you have them. Um, but I would also, because a lot of times crop insurance is very situational to your farm situation, I would be happy to talk to any of you individually about crop insurance, and you can let Ethan or Teresa know, and we can make an appointment also to try to talk about. And I'm at this point open for questions. Okay, so I do not see any questions in the chat box. Um, however, if someone has a question and they'd like to unmute themselves, feel free to do that. Um, otherwise, we can, uh, you can email Elizabeth and uh, think with that. 
I don't see anyone unmuting themselves, so I'm going to guess we don't have any questions right now. Um, before we go, why don't we, um, well, thank you, uh, Liz, for that presentation. I know it's 121 and folks are probably eager to um, get on with the rest of their day. So I'm going to just thank everyone for joining and um, you know, re a reminder that you will be receiving another reminder for our next and final workshop in the series, which will be March 30th. And the topic for uh, next week is uh, preserving and enhancing beneficial insects on the farm. So uh, again, thank you everyone. And uh, thank you to the language justice team and uh, to our speakers.